The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line.
The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line.
The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the fourth virtual roundtable event hosted by Altius Healthcare Consulting Group. We're excited today to welcome panelists Marshall Busco, Jim Jorgensen, and Donna Showers, moderated by Altius CEO, Stephanie Dorward. Now for just a few quick housekeeping tips for our new attendees. Um, as you can see on the screen in front of you, we are giving you the option to ask questions today through, uh, through the either the GoToWebinar uh, version, whether you're watching on Facebook or on YouTube today. If you're joining us through GoToWebinar, you'll see on your screen there's a questions panel. You can enter a question in this panel. We'll be alerted and we'll break in to ask the panelists your question. Also, you may opt to raise your hand. If you raise your hand during the session, we'll know that you want to speak with us. When we get to a break, we'll call on you and we will unmute you and let you speak. With that being said, I'm going to pass the, <clears throat> the reins here over to Altia CEO Stephanie Dorr for today's webinar. Thanks a lot. Take it away, Steph. Thank you, Brian. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the fourth episode of our roundtable discussions. I am excited today to join the, the stage with three other panelists, Jim Jorgensen, Donna Showers, and Marshall Busco. We have a lot of great content for you today, and we're going to start with just talking about a few updates that we have that we've collected on staffing areas and a few general tips for you to consider as you continue with your planning sessions for both now and the future. And then we're gonna hear from Jim Jorgensen on some specific pharmacy staffing questions that we've received, as well as things that he has picked up over the last several weeks on how pharmacies should respond to the COVID-19 pandemic, and more importantly, plan for the future. I'm then going to have a conversation with Marshall Busco from Intelair about what they're hearing within the marketplace from their members within the supply chain regarding staffing concerns that they have and also solutions that hospitals and healthcare executives may consider right now given the pandemic. And then we will conclude with information from Donna Showers, focusing on laboratory, uh, both updates on rate you know, diagnostic and what's happening within the diagnostic laboratory market and some general information that I think everyone within the panel will find extremely useful. So I thank you so much for participating today, whether you're participating live, you're downloading it within our client portal, or you're joining us on YouTube or Facebook. So we'll start today with just a few general updates that we have collected on the continuing situation. And number one, CDC has issued some new guidance for all hospital and healthcare entities, regardless of what stage of the pandemic you're in. The guidance is very general, but in general, they're saying that anyone entering your facility should be wearing a cloth face mask to prevent the risk of transmission. And in addition, that all hospital and healthcare entities should really be considering checking all healthcare employees coming into the unit or coming into the organization or facility to see if they're exhibiting symptoms. And what they're saying is that everyone needs to be screened and triaged as if they may actually have the COVID-19 virus. So just a few updates on the CDC. Uh, one of the things that we have been hearing a lot from our clients is how do you educate right now with the, the midst of the pan, you know, crisis? A lot of you are dealing with cross-training. You are actually trying to heighten individual staffing members and elevating their skill set. And what we're seeing right now is a big push to just-in-time learning and just-in-case learning. And there are a lot of platforms that are pushing this out via tablets, pushing it out on cell phones, and it's ranging from actually training individuals within your organization on very basic respiratory information, emergency department information, and critical care protocols in case they are called upon to be on the front lines. We're also seeing the push with non-clinical staff in certain hospitals, to administer tests that they may have not been responsible for in the past and training protocols and steps to get them up to speed on the proper um, notifications and what they should do in those situations. And also seeing non-staff register patients, people that typically haven't been involved in revenue cycle or stepping in and actually taking these roles in both triage stations, emergency department and other places. And this just in time, just in learning protocol is again, they're really micro learning sessions that are very short, but some of them are getting very detailed on how you can operate different ventilators. Uh, there are a lot of ventilators hitting the market that staff have not been trained on, and those modules can be downloaded onto tablets and trained quickly. 
We're also seeing some rich virtual learning devices and stages there. So just this platform for education is changing quickly. And we just want everyone to be aware that these solutions are available to you from supply chain and medical device vendors that are actually pushing these out into the industry. Also, we're hearing a lot about patient communication. And you know, just a few guidelines on effective communication in the face of a, you know environment where we're dealing with fear and anxiety. One of the ways that you can reach out quicker, because we know that this becomes very cumbersome for staff, both in clinics and hospitals, is create small groups of your patients, whether they're groups that are specific to one individual specialty area or groups that are specific to your entire patient panel. And when you're doing this, you want to reach out to them regarding your protocols for canceling and rescheduling both elective procedures, non-elective procedures, reach out just in regards to what patients, visitors, et cetera, are permitted to come into the hospital or healthcare facility. Work to communicate the changes in hours and service and provide any additional information that you can for those patients that are requesting care. As we talked about last week, a lot of the platforms are moving more towards virtual video monitoring as well as video appointments. We've had a lot of clients have been successful and push emails out to their patients about how to use those video platforms and how to enroll and actually schedule those appointments. You can even do things such as actually videoing someone registering on the site on their cell phone. So you're actually documenting the registration process and the steps by doing screenshots and screen videos and then pushing that out to patients so that they can actually walk through that process. This can be loaded up to your my chart. It can be loaded up to any of those features to really help with those. So you can send information on signs, symptoms, tests, and spreads, and then ultimately help to extend waiting rooms as well as offer additional telemedicine options. Just a few last you know, comments on staffing in general right now. You know, as we talk through this, we're seeing our clients and hospitals really focusing on three different levels. They're looking at long-term strategy because what we have realized quickly is the long-term strategic plans or short-term strategic plans that your hospital or healthcare entity have had probably are not as valid as they were six months ago, which means we're seeing a lot of senior executive teams revisit those plans and adjusting them. So there's the strategic component where you're working on forward sets of assumptions. We also right now are seeing operational plans being built about how do you react for today, right now, but also what should that operational plan look like three months down the road, six months down the road, nine months down the road. And then in general, we're seeing the crisis planning. So depending on whether you're in a COVID-19 hot section of the country or a section that really hasn't seen any cases, you're responding to this crisis and which really demands the fluid set of assumptions. We are providing the next here for our um, clients on the pathway to the next normal. And what this really involves is really bridging between all three of these and fluidly moving between strategy, operational needs and ultimately crisis needs. And as we do this, we're working with you to do those demand projections for what you need right now, given the current crisis based off your true volume levels, what you're going to need three months down the road, looking at some volume rebound projections and or stagnation, six months down the road, nine months down the road and 12 months down the road. And while we're doing this, we're helping you to understand where you can continue to cross train both documenting and evaluating staff that you have possible in those cross train areas, because that might be important right now, but it may help you with efficiencies down the road as well. We're looking at you and uh, helping you expand telemedicine where you may need to, and then ultimately really helping to project those scenarios moving forward. So if you need support in any of those areas, please make sure that you reach out to Altius, uh, your contact rep, or to me directly, or to Randy Lynn, because we're really focusing on nine to 18 month plans right now. Uh, what we have told bit by industry experts is they are expecting a long-term rebound to pre-COVID-19 numbers. And in order to plan for that, it's always better to plan conservatively and then extend beyond that. So with that, that's the general staffing information. And if you have additional questions on that, I'll answer them at the end of the round table. And we're going to move into some pharmacy discussions. So welcome, Jim, to the panel today and the roundtable. We're really excited to have you with us. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, maybe just a little bit of background too on myself. Uh, uh, 35 years of health system pharmacy leadership before I joined uh, my current uh, company, Vsant. Um, I was in the Chicago area for 15 years with the Franciscan Alliance. I was the senior pharmacy executive at the University of Utah. 
uh, for 14 years, and then I was the senior pharmacy executive for the Indiana University Health System. And while I was at Utah, I also had occasion to uh, direct pharmacy elements for the 2002 Winter Olympics, uh, which was interesting because a large part of my responsibility was planning for a mass casualty event. So what will we do in case of a bioterrorism event or a chemical event? And uh, it's amazing. I never thought I would be using that material again, but repurposing it for uh, what we're experiencing situation, a lot of it is, is certainly relevant and germane today. And in addition to our normal consulting work uh, across the country, uh, we also have the, uh, the privilege of leading the pharmacy programs for the University of California, San Francisco. Uh, so in addition to general consulting, we're, we're on the front lines um, as well. So, you know, much of my comments today will be based on our experience at UCSF, of clients that we get the opportunity to interact with uh, across the country on a, on a regular basis. And you know, what we're seeing in hospitals right now is a, a dramatic shift. You know, most hospitals, at least our client base, we're running probably 80 to, uh, to high 90s in terms of occupancy and uh, clinic utilization, and that has dropped precipitously. Um, we're seeing most hospitals now down in the 40 to 50 percent occupancy rate. Um, everything but uh, cru crucial clinic visits have been curtailed. Um, Stephanie, and I were, Stephanie and I were talking before we started. Uh, she even had one hospital that was down in the in the 10 to 20 percent range uh, for census. So the way hospitals operate have definitely uh, really shifted. And what we're seeing is a is a big shift towards critical care uh, away from general med surge. So most hospitals find themselves overstaffed in terms of med surge resources and med surge beds and understaffed in terms of critical care beds and critical care resources. Uh, but what we've seen in the pharmacy is even though there's a, a, a big uh, reduction in overall census, uh, pharmacy workload has actually gone up uh, basically because uh, of the amount of medication support needed for that big influx and surge of critical care patients. Uh, so just uh, some general thoughts and tips on, on staffing in terms of the pharmacy. Um, as you experience increases for extra staff uh, in your clean rooms to be able to accommodate that, that increased demand. Uh, you also want, might want to look at some compressed staffing uh, or scheduling options. So a lot of organizations are extending their staffing out from eight hours to now 10 hours and 12 hour shifts. Again, trying to decrease turnover and potential exposure uh, of their staff uh, to the virus. Want to really re revisit your uh, sick call guidelines. So, what would you do um, if a, a large section of your staff uh, found themselves unable to come to work? How would you be able to respond to that? Um, what we've seen is typically in the hospital world, um, you know, their workload is a little bit lighter on evening, night, and weekend shifts. That is not the case in uh, a COVID surge. It's all hands on deck, there is no downtime. It's as busy around the clock as it is any other time during the during the day. So plan for uh, that type of, of workload. Um, it's also advisable, given that type of workload, uh, that you plan to have a manager in the pharmacy 24 hours a day um, to help uh, mitigate and, and respond to emerging situations, because this situation changes you know, not only by the day, almost by the hour. One of the plans that a lot of hospitals had as well uh, to mitigate some of the, the workload demands in the central pharmacy was they were planning on uh, repurposing their clinical staff, uh, the clinical pharmacy staff that works up in the patient care areas, uh, supporting. Uh, if they needed, needed them, they were thinking they could just pull them back down into the central pharmacy. Clearly, that is not a good plan, as we found out. Uh, the workload demands and the needs to have clinical staff available in the patient care areas to support clinicians and uh, prescribers is greatly increased. Recognizing that now we might have a lot of nurses and physicians working in critical care units that aren't all that experienced uh, with that practice setting and having pharmacists there to help them uh, with medication selection and dosing is, is really critical. So what we're seeing is emerging drug shortages uh, particularly around sed sedation medications, analgesia medications, paralytics, hydroxychloroquine, uh, multi-dose uh, multi inhalers, and crash cart medications. So having someone there that understands if option A isn't, isn't available, what can you use for option B, C, or D, and then how do you dose those drugs and how do you monitor those drugs is really invaluable. I think the other thing we're finding is that patients in the critical care unit on ventilators 
often require way larger doses than most prescribers are used to using. So again, having an experienced pharmacist there that can guide them on how to prescribe those larger doses and how to monitor those, those larger doses so that you don't cause harm uh, is crucial. We're also finding with a lot of patients with extended intensive care stays that there's an increased risk of thrombosis, so uh, blood clots. So again, having someone there that can really effectively help monitor to prevent uh, deep vein thrombosis, or even finding that with the COVID patients now, there's an increased risk of uh, uh, thrombosis in the microvasculature of the, of the lungs. So what laboratory um, uh, values should, should be monitored regularly? And having another set of eyes to do that is really important. And then I think if anybody's been watching the news, you're seeing a lot of daily chatter about uh, unapproved use of approved medications, hydroxychloroquine, chloroquine, azithromycin. Um, the data on all of these drugs is really not very good. And we understand that there's a lot of unapproved clinical trials going on out there. You know, when you don't have anything else to try, a lot of prescribers are, are willing to try some of these drugs. But they're not as innocuous, I think, as, as a lot of the literature or uh, discussions might seem. Yeah, with uh, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, there's a severe drug interaction that can cause QTC prolongation in the heart, which basically results in potentially fatal uh, arrhythmias. So again, having someone that understands that side effect, knows what to look for and can monitor that so that first we prevent any harm is, is really important as we're starting to use drugs that you know we really don't have any experience with in these types of patients. The other thing that the pharmacists have really been invaluable with is as places get more innovative with delivery systems, uh, the pharmacists can help them really think through to make sure that the patients are getting the, uh, the desired drugs in the right doses. And one good example of that is intravenous pumps. So you obviously don't wanna bring your pump into a room with a COVID infected patient. So a lot of organizations are really getting innovative. They're drilling a hole in the wall and they're using computer conduit going through the wall, create that mile long uh, 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 tubing setup uh, that can really impact um, the performance of the pump and the delivery of the medication. So again, having an experienced resource to help you think through that is fantastic. Um, we're also seeing a lot of organizations looking at remote work options with the pharmacists. So order verification, you can really do that function anywhere. Um, so there's no real need to bring some of those staff into the hospital. So again, you can help mitigate potential transmission of the virus by taking advantage of those remote work options. Uh, a lot of places are also thinking of cohorting their staff, so creating smaller pods of staff, so that if someone was infected, they wouldn't affect the larger staff um, on the whole. And then uh, think about sharing or pooling staff between hospitals. I know in San Francisco, the hospitals have all got together. Um, they designated one hospital as a surge hospital with excess bed capacity, so if everyone does get overwhelmed, they can all fall back on that. And then uh, the School of Pharmacy at the University of California, San Francisco is actually going to be repurposing their faculty, their, their pharmacist faculty, uh, to support that surge unit uh, if it's necessary. So get a little innovative with that. And also think about how you're going to get your staff to work, uh, because with public transportation disruptions, that's the primary transportation mode for a lot of staff in a lot of big cities. So if the subways aren't working, if the metro isn't working, if the buses aren't working, if you don't have access to Uber and Lyft, how are you actually gonna get your staff to work? So think about that. And then really just think about activities of daily living for your staff. Um, one of the really cool things that uh, we've seen some of the hospitals do in the Bay Area is they've recognized that uh, their staff are working longer hours. So now 10 and 12 hour shifts and the grocery stores have compressed hours. So a lot of their staff are saying they, they can't get to the grocery store uh, for to purchase essentials. So the hospitals are actually bringing the grocery stores to their staffs. So they've uh, worked out arrangements with local grocery stores and they've set up many grocery stores in the lobbies of the hospital since you're not really using the lobbies for patients anymore. So staff can now buy essentials um, at work uh, so that they don't have to make that extra trip to the, uh, to the grocery store. So you know, I think the big thing is, uh, is really you know, think out of the box because there's a lot of uh, a lot of changes going on. Uh, one one last point I want to make too is uh, it's crucial that you have pharmacists in the patient care areas now because of the high likelihood of codes, um, cardiac arrest situations. 
I was watching the news uh, the night before last and they were interviewing a nurse at uh, one of the New York City hospitals and she was holding up an EKG tracing and indicating that they had 10 cardiac arrests going on all at the same time in their intensive care unit. So plan ahead for these types of things. How are you gonna handle your, uh, your codes? Make sure you have the, the minimum number of people that need to be in that room, in the room. Don't bring the code cards in the room. Have the pharmacist outside the room prepping the meds to pass back into the room uh, for the nurses and the physicians that are that are providing the, the direct patient care for that uh, for that code. And then you might want to think about things like you know the, the defibrillator typically sits on top of the code card. Find another a transport mechanism for that defibrillator because that absolutely has to go in the room. But if you don't have to bring the code card into the room, then you don't have to worry about decontaminating it. And then finally, for your retail pharmacy, um, think about how you might minimize traffic for the retail pharmacy. So if your patients do need their meds, don't bring them into the hospital-based retail pharmacy. Think about creating meds to curbs where you can actually deliver those things out to your employees or your patients that need them without having to increase traffic in the pharmacy. But you know, the whole thing is how do we support these patients? At the same time, how do we mitigate the potential transmission of the virus to our staff and their families? I know a lot of places, uh, I was talking to uh, Arash Debastani, uh, who's the chief pharmacy officer at New York University Langone. Hilton has actually donated uh, a tower at the hotel so that the NYU staff can now quarantine themselves and stay at the Hilton and not have to worry about bringing uh, the virus home. But if you do have staff that is going back and forth in home, you should really think about what are the processes and procedures that everyone's going to be following so that they can mitigate risk uh, of, of actually transmitting that virus back home? Definitely a, a new world right now. So thank you. Uh, just, just some um, initial thoughts there. I'll turn it back to you, Stephanie. So a lot of great information, Jim. Really appreciate the advice uh, that you're providing to you know, the hospital community on what they should be considering right now in pharmacy. Uh, before we you know, twist our topic to another you know, area of the hospital, be focusing their attention? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, concomitant with the 40 to 50 percent reduction in census, hospitals are seeing a 40 to 50 percent reduction in revenue. And, you know, for a lot of hospitals, uh, they have limited cash reserves. And so this is really concerning. So as we look at, you know, what comes after the, the uh, post-COVID situation, I think trying to find any mechanism that you can to quickly reduce expenses, eliminate expenses, or uh, mitigate expenses is, is key. And at the same time, where can you find revenue um, to replace that? And pharmacy is a great place to look. And 340B, certainly uh, for places that uh, are eligible, uh, is really important. So what can you do to actually optimize your 340B savings? because uh, that's immediate money um, in your pocket. What should you be doing in terms of looking at uh, your, your current claims, uh, your current purchasing, uh, your contract pharmacy arrangements to pick up as many quick dollars as you can? And then the other phenomenon is, you know, we've had 17,000 people lose their jobs and, it's, and that count continues to go up. Um, many of them will lose their employer-sponsored health insurance in the next 60 to 90 days. So projections are that, you know, we could very quickly see 12,000 people with no health insurance. Um, many of them will have to revert back to state Medicaid if they're eligible. Um, and that influx in Medicaid numbers could actually change the disproportionate share adjustment percentage, which is the threshold for organizations to be eligible three, for 340B. So a lot of organizations that aren't currently eligible could find themselves in an eligible situation in the near future. So they really should be paying attention to that. And if they are eligible, um, you can only enroll quarterly for the next quarter, so they want to make sure that they maximize that enrollment opportunity to get into the program um, as soon as possible. And then there's a number of opportunities in pharmacy on the revenue side, you know, looking at uh, infusions, retail pharmacy, specialty pharmacy, um, uh, pharmacy benefit management services that can really impact uh, bottom line. We had one major academic medical center pre-COVID where we, we worked to optimize all of those uh, solutions. They went from 42% of the hospital EBITDA to 76% of the hospital EBITDA in 12 to 14 months. So I, their senior leadership said that it would appear that the hospital is now just a lost leader for the pharmacy service. So it is some place that you can look um, to pick up some, some return on investment fairly quickly. Thank you. That's great information and, and definitely information I think everyone can find useful right now. So I really appreciate you know, your thoughtfulness on this. And for the rest of the audience, uh, we will be inviting Jim to our podcast next week. 
So make sure if you enjoyed the content that he provided to you today that you look for his podcast episode with us coming in the next few weeks. Thank you so much, Jim. Really appreciate you participating today. Thank you for the invitation. Definitely. And with that, we're going to shift gears a little bit to speak with Marshall Busco from Intelair. And we're going to talk you know, first and foremost about you know, some of the things that he's been hearing from the members, not just about staffing, but you know, concerns in general. And then second, we'll talk about you know, things that the C-suite should really be focusing on right now as you consider you know, what your next steps are, either operationally, strategically, or long-term. So Marshall, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, I appreciate Stephanie. Thank you for having me on the call. Um, Jim, you put out a lot of good information, and I think I'm going to be a little redundant in some of the things I say because it was right on, on point there. Um, one of the things we did several years ago was to develop a, a disaster preparedness program for our membership. And primarily that focused around natural disasters, hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, and so forth. But, you know, we recommended everybody having one, develop a playbook, have policies and procedures, test it, manage it, reassess, you know, redo it again. And we fortunately just uh, third quarter last year redid it internally. For our, for our own team. So we staffed up and we you know, put together a command center and, and functions for people in various different areas. And I don't know if it was prescient, but our timing played out pretty well. So when the pandemic hit, we were prepared from an internal standpoint to provide resources to our members or direct them to resources if we didn't have those where they could get you know, supplies, answers, solutions, and so forth. Um, from a supply chain perspective, I think the first thing that rose up on everybody's uh, horizon was uh, PPE, ventilators, things that folks were having difficulty to get. And so we put together a, a landing page on our, our member portal with information that spans about on, on COVID. And if we had relationships with organizations that uh, had access to, to such supplies, we put their information out there pretty much daily because everything's in flux and it changes pretty well. Um, another area that we saw a, a, a big request for was computers, laptops, network security with the uh, some of the remote facilities, the triage units, the telework, the tele, telehealth going together. People were having a tough time getting equipment and uh, we allocated and got our suppliers together to do the same thing. So they're posting out on, on the website what type of supplies they can get. I mean, if you're buying a HP and you're standardized on that, you might not be able to get HP. You know, a Dell would work or a Lenovo would work. And, and I think people need to understand that as they're going as well. I think the, uh, you know, the cybersecurity around that, you know, you, you saw on the, on the trades and the publications and the newspapers and, and television, a lot of folks using Zoom. You know, we were big on having something that was HIPAA compliant so that folks wouldn't expose themselves in, in other ways out there and have some solutions in those areas to direct people to. Uh, drugs was another area that Jim talked about. You know, we have a, a pharmacy team that works with the manufacturers out there diligently to get any particular update and work with our members to put them in the right directions to find such supplies if the supplies are available at all. And if there's backwards on certain things, we post those backwards and what the time frames might be along that area. Um, personnel, clinical personnel right now, especially in hot spot areas, you know, there are premiums being paid for people. I talked to some folks out in California and they say, you know, I could get pretty much any job I wanted to. So, you know, that might be your staff that's getting poached. You, you need to think about that a little bit from that perspective. And, and if you are in a hot spot, you might have to pay a premium to do something like that as well. I think, uh, Jim, you hit another one was, was the decline in revenue of, of organizations you're seeing right now. In order for people to staff up or to buy equipment or to get ventilators or send their telehealth program and their infrastructure, they're going to need capital. And one of the things that we recognized early on was many of those organizations operate on very slim margins and don't have uh, an endowment or, or you know, a, a resource that they could get cash quickly. So we worked with a couple of our uh, leasing partners to develop a, a short-term lease that could be rolled over. 
So for instance, if, if you needed X amount of gear to set up a, a telehealth program or put a, out a uh, triage unit, you put that on a four month lease. If in four months, pandemic's still there, you could roll that lease over. Maybe another three, four months, you could roll it over again. But at the end, when things start going back to normal, you're not stuck with a capital purchase. You, you freed up your capital to do some other things in your organizations, so which really made sense. And I think this plays especially well in the, uh, you know, the rural markets, the small hospital markets. Uh, they haven't seen some such uh, impact, I think, of some of the urban areas simply because of density. But again, they don't have the resources usually that the large academic medical centers have or, or some of the big systems in some of the cities out there. So we're trying to think outside of the box most of the time. We think that uh, you know, we have a capable team. We have resources in, in pretty much every, every functional area that we can uh, direct people to from pharmacy to med surge, lab, DI, IT, uh, plant and engineering, supply chain, you know, food and nutrition, uh, you name it. And that spans all classes of trades. That's not only acute care, but that's pretty much in, in every form of, of non-acute care as well. So providing good information, I think um, you said it earlier, Stephanie, I, I don't think you can over communicate. You know, we've seen in different states where information is, is tough to find. You don't know how many people have been exposed. You don't know how many have been tested. You don't even know the, the race of some of these people that, that have uh, tested positive. So I think one thing that organizations can do to their teams is, is cascade information on a regular basis. You know, let people know what's going on. It, it restores the faith that everybody's in this together. We're getting good information from our leadership and we're moving in the right direction. So I'll, I'll pause there for a second. Marshall, I think that was I great think, information on a lot of the different areas that organizations should be looking at right now, not only from a supply perspective, but also from organizational and financial health overall. You know, what we're seeing our clients do is really focus in on all aspects. So it's a matter of how they can just sustain operations right now with enough staffing, with enough resources and enough revenue to continue. So I think you touched upon a lot of great areas that they can certainly look and things that they should be thinking about right now. So I really appreciate you joining and sharing some knowledge today. Thank you. So we're going to transition to Donna for some laboratory. And again, to all of the listeners right now, if you have specific questions on either pharmacy, laboratory, supply chain, or staffing in general, uh, please make sure you either raise your hand or drop those in the chat box. We'll make sure at the end of the session that we answer all of your questions. In addition, if there are other areas, departments, concerns that you have, either as a department manager, director, or hospital executive, please make sure you reach out to us to provide that information to us as well, because we'll ensure that we tackle those topics on the next episodes of both our podcast, Altius Answers, as well as our virtual roundtable. And with that, I'd like to welcome Donna Showers to the presentation and virtual roundtable. Donna, thank you so much for joining with us today. I'm excited to hear what you have to say about laboratories. And Donna is going to really share some detailed responses that we've seen within laboratory and information that I think everyone's gonna find extremely useful. Thank you, Stephanie. You can go ahead and go to my second slide, please. So if you're not from laboratory, laboratory can be kind of mysterious and unknown to people. So um, my presentation today, I'm gonna to kind of give you some um, information about lab and about testing that you may not know, just to help develop a good framework. Then I'm going to go into uh, what the testing capacity is with the various labs around the country. I'm gonna talk a little bit about supply chain issues and best practices. And then I'm gonna share a really interesting interview that I had with a local uh, lab lead here in the Minneapolis market. Next slide, please. So when you think about uh, COVID-19 and lab testing, it really is um, a perfect storm, if you will. I have personally been involved in lobbying efforts um, with national and local legislators on three particular topics that have crippled the laboratory and made them um, perhaps not as able to respond to this COVID-19 situation as well as they could because of these issues. And these issues have not been uh, resolved by our legislators, but I know for a fact that they are getting um, 
<laughs> a little bit better attention today because of the pandemic that we're dealing with. The first one is workforce shortages. Uh, med techs um, and histotechs and cytotechs and phlebotomists are um, in very short supply because we are unable to keep up with the demand. Uh, the schools and the internship programs just aren't turning out as many um, of these uh, skilled workers uh, to be able to keep up uh, with even normal demands for lab testing, much less being able to keep up with the testing requirements today with the COVID-19. Uh, the second issue is something called the Protecting Access to Medicare Act, or PAMA. Basically, this uh, it really just reflects uh, CMS uh, drastically uh, reducing reimbursement to laboratories through the fee schedule. Uh, the reduction in reimbursement uh, is uh, impacting labs by billions of dollars, which means that today labs are pretty cash-strapped to be able to make investments in technology. Um, some labs have even had to shut down because of lack of funding, and this uh, really affects uh, especially rural communities without easy access uh, to lab testing when these labs shut down. I will say that um, in response to COVID-19, the CARES Act has at least frozen the cuts from PAMA uh, that were scheduled to be implemented in 2021, uh, but this uh, is really a, a small concession uh, considering all that labs are facing today. And finally, uh, the third thing is uh, oversight for something called a laboratory developed test. This is where a laboratory develops a test that's not available commercially uh, for a specific reason. Um, there hasn't been clear-cut guidelines for who provides oversight um, or even the guidelines for how uh, labs should be developing these tests. The FDA and CMS have kind of been pointing the fingers at each other, like which entity should be, um, you know, over providing oversight for this. There is um, a piece of legislation now called the VALID Act. It stands for Verifying Accurate Leading Edge um, IVCT is In Vitro Clinical Test Development Act uh, that is being reviewed by legislators today. And uh, hopefully we will see this pass shortly uh, so that we can have better oversight for LDTs. So next slide, please. So just a few quick definitions. Um, when we talk about COVID-19, this really is the disease itself, okay? This is the disease that we're all talking about with the pandemic, COVID-19. If you ever see something called SARS-CoV-2, this is actually the name of the coronavirus 2 itself. There's many coronaviruses, okay? They've been around for a long time, but the one that we're dealing with right now dur during this pandemic is known as SARS-CoV-2, and this is what the laboratories will refer to it as. And what is SARS-CoV-2? This virus is actually um, a single strand of RNA, ribonucleic acid. Um, an R a strand of RNA on its own really can't do much of anything until it invades um, a host. Um, once uh, this virus invades a host, it uh, penetrates the host cells and it takes over programming of the DNA to be able to make replicate copies of itself. So I'm pretty sure that this is where computer virus terminology came from, where we know that uh, certain coding can infect our computers and, and reprogram it uh, through that. So. Finally, when we talk about immunity or seroconversion, um, anytime the human body is exposed to something that is not itself, i.e. a virus, after a period of time, uh, the human body usually produces antibodies. Um, that's how the immune system deals with recognizing um, an invader should it uh, encounter that invader again in the future. So for the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus, um, once a, a person has been exposed to to it, usually in about 10 to 14 days, uh, the uh, person will begin developing antibodies. Now, this may or may not indicate that a person has immunity to the, the disease. We just haven't had enough time to study it, um, but it will certainly show that the person has been exposed to it. Next slide, please. Okay, FDA and lab tests. Currently, there are no FDA-approved tests on the market for SARS-CoV-2, which is really a little bit frightening when you think about it. Um, normally for, um, let's say a manufacturer wants to develop and market a test, a laboratory test, uh, to go through the FDA process in order to get approval can take years. It can take up to five years from start to finish um, for uh, you know a diagnostic manufacturer to get their product through the FDA. But because we're dealing with a pandemic right now, the FDA has um, an expedited process called um, EUA, uh, which is Emergency Use Authorization. 
So a manufacturer or uh, a laboratory themselves uh, can complete a validation study of a test that they want to off offer. Um, once they complete the validation study, they can begin using that test uh, for uh, whatever it is that they're looking to measure. Uh, in this case, it would be SARS-CoV-2. Um, within uh, 15 days of completing the validation study, they need to send uh, their results to the FDA and then they wait uh, to get uh, the emergency use authorization from the FDA. Now, if this happens uh, within an actual laboratory, that's known as a laboratory developed test, uh, that particular laboratory may utilize uh, um, their states uh, to authorize uh, that test to be able to, to offer that to their patients. Next slide, please. So today, um, for SARS-CoV-2, we have two different types of tests uh, that are being offered. Um, the FDA categorizes diagnostic tests by their level of complexity, okay, from least to most complex. So sometimes when we think of a lab test, we might think of something simple like a, like a pregnancy test where you get a little stick and you apply a urine sample and you wait for the plus sign or the minus sign to indicate where, whether or not you are pregnant. Now that would be a wave test or a very low complex test. When we're talking about tests for SARS-CoV-2, COV these are very high complexity lab tests, okay? So the first one um, is a real-time uh, PCR test. Um, this is a molecular test that actually identifies either the presence or the absence of the virus itself, okay? Generally, these are run in batches on high throughput instruments in the lab. They can take anywhere from 45 minutes to eight hours from start to finish before you have a result. But on these types of analyzers, again, generally they're run in batches, so that 45 minutes to eight hours can produce you know, hundreds of results all at one time. Uh, the sample collection for this would be something, um, the best is a nasopharyngeal swab. Um, there are other types of swabs that can be used. Um, once the sample is separate, emergency use authorizations for molecular testing of SARS-CoV-2 and 13 laboratory developed tests. Now, again, this process took weeks, not years, to develop, um, and it will be really interesting to see once this pandemic has passed, which of these tests actually had um, really good sensitivity and specificity, and which ones uh, perhaps didn't. Um, the CDC themselves has also developed a test, um, and that's being run by most of the state labs. So that's the test specifically specifically to look for the virus. But what about the serology tests? Again, high complexity test, but these are immunoassays that actually identify the presence or antibody or presence or absence of antibodies. And sometime it indicates a class of antibodies. This really just shows if you have an active or past um, infection. Uh, the sample collection for this is a simple um, uh, blood collection, um, so you don't need all those other supplies. You just need to have what you need to take a blood sample. And as of April 14th, the FDA has granted three emergency use authorizations for serology tests. Next slide, please. Okay, what about drive-through testing? I'm sure many of you have seen this in your communities or certainly seen it on the news. Um, I think that this um, definition is a little bit misleading because in most instances, you're not actually driving through and getting a test. What you're doing is you're driving through and having a sample collected. So once the sample is co collected, um, then it is sent to a laboratory for testing. And for many of these drive-through testing sites or sample collection sites, the patient first needs to have an order um, from um, um, a healthcare provider or um, a general practitioner. So they need to have talked to a medical professional, professional talked about their symptoms, whether they've been exposed to anyone with uh, COVID-19 to be able to get you know, the, um, the order to go through and have this testing done. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about uh, one of the newer entrants to the market that has gotten a lot of publicity, if any of you saw when President Trump actually <laughs> uncreated one of these on live TV. It's called the Abbott ID Now. 
This is a rapid molecular test for SARS-CoV-2. It can give results in five minutes for a positive and 13 minutes for a negative result, um, which is stunning when you think about it, five minutes for a result. The only thing is the Abbott ID now can only run one test at a time. Okay, so it's not like those batch analyzers I talked about. This one only cranks out one test at a time. Um, they do have emergency use oper emergency use authorization to offer this test point of care, which means that in that complexity level that I talked about, this is actually CLIA waived. So this is being offered in some Walgreens and CVS pharmacies, um, but uh, because of government allocation, it is being distributed first to the hotspots in the country, as well as some state public health labs. Next slide. Okay, what about a commercial reference lab uh, testing um, and uh, state labs? Um, as of April 14th, we have um, 95 public health labs across 50 states uh, that are doing testing for uh, SARS-CoV-2. And then I've just listed here, and I got this information directly from their websites, four of the largest commercial reference labs. Uh, we've got LabCorp uh, performing about 500,000 tests to date. They can run about 40,000 a day. Their turnaround time is anywhere from two to four days. They were experiencing extreme backlogs early on. According to their website, they have caught up uh, and are able to uh, turn out results in two to four days. Uh, Quest so far has uh, performed 800,000 tests. They can do 45,000 a day. Turnaround time, again, one to two days. Uh, Mayo uh, is one of the um, emergency use authorization locations that is offering serology testing. Uh, they're doing about 8,000 a day. They just started this last week. Uh, their turnaround time is about one, uh, one day. And they are also uh, participating in something called the Convalescent Plasma Program. And what this is, is when you have patients that test positive for antibodies to the SARS-CoV-2 virus, you can collect plasma um, and transfuse it into um, another patient, which hopefully will transmit and testing um, simply because of the allocations of both capital equipment and testing reagents to other areas of the country that were considered to be uh, in higher need than um, uh, the Rocky Mountains. Next slide, please. Um, some new testing that is currently being evaluated by the FDA. They're looking at a saliva test. Um, Rutgers University has been granted emergency use authorization as of April 13th. Um, Helix in San Diego just finished validation also for a saliva test, which would certainly make uh, collecting specimens much easier if we didn't have to do nasopharyngeal swabs. Um, the FDA is also looking at some home sample collection kits. Uh, the first submissions were not approved. They're looking at some home testing kits. Again, the first submissions have not been uh, approved. They're also very interested in looking at 3D printing of the various types of swabs that are needed to collect specimens. Next slide, please. So what about the supply chain constraints? So much like uh, personal protective equipment um, for laboratory testing, um, there are also um, severe shortages of products um, because the national government and the Department of Defense are working with suppliers to allocate these supplies, which would be specimen collection, test kits, capital equipment to high need areas. In other parts of the country, there are severe supply shortages, uh, especially again in the rural areas. So this is just a quote from Cindy Johnson, who is a senior director of lab services at Centricare, which is a large IDN system in the central part of the state of Minnesota. She's also the president of the American Society of Clinical Lab Science. And her quote is, central Minnesota is a big black hole. We can't get SARS-CoV-2 reagent kits for equipment we already own, nor can we get new equipment reagents for at least two months. We are also constrained by a lack of sample collection products. So her laboratory is not able to do any testing in-house, and they are dependent upon state labs as well as commercial reference labs in order to get results for their patients, which at least they have some place they can send them, but the turnaround time is not always uh, optimal uh, for some patients. Next slide, please. 
So here are some best practices for rural provider labs. This information came to us from Intelair members in a couple of town hall meetings that we've had with them. Um, one of the things that they suggested is limiting the number of techs who actually collect samples um, from COVID or COVID suspected patients. And this can reduce uh, exposure to you know, your staff as well as conserve PPE. Um, they talked about either autoclaving or UV sterilization of masks, um, N95 masks. In some cases, they're making their own ma masks out of surgical grade fabric. Um, some of them have dedicated a special courier just for transferring COVID samples either to the state lab or to commercial reference labs. In some instances, they found local pilots that would be willing to transport specimens to testing sites. Um, in dealing with the shortages of transport media, they're finding ways to aliquot it. So if uh, the transport media comes three milliliters to a tube, they're kind of pouring that off and trying to get two samples out of one. And also they're, uh, they're prioritizing their patients' uh, specimens on, on where to send them to either state labs or to uh, reference labs. Next slide, please. Okay, and I'll finish today with um, an interview that I had with health partners um, and specifically with Rick Panning, who's the Senior Administrative Director of the Lab Services at Health Partners. He's also a member of the Minnesota Governor's uh, COVID-19 Task Force and Test Work Group. Health Partners is an integrated nonprofit healthcare provider and health insurance company located in Bloomington, Minnesota, offering care coverage, research, and education to its members, patients, and the community. Next slide, please. So according to Rick, he said that their lab is currently performing about 325 tests a day in their central lab, which meets the needs for their inpatients, their emergency department patients, and symptomatic healthcare workers and their household members. He said they're testing 24 seven and 100% of the results within 24 hours, 65% within 12 hours, and they're performing on two separate platforms. Tomorrow, they're going to begin testing at some of their hospitals um, with uh, yet another platform, which can do about 160 per day and for using so many different platforms. And he said, we can't get enough testing supplies from just one vendor because of the government all allocations. Plus, the throughput on each analyzer is different. So that's why they're ordering so many different ones. And he said, it's also good to have multiple platforms for backup and to repeat questionable results. So Rick is also uh, implementing uh, a, a prioritization of patient testing, starting with inpatient and uh, ED patients. Um, second, they go on to sy symptomatic obstetrics, labor and delivery patients, and they're going to add asymptomatic in a week or two. Um, then they move to hospitalized surgery patients. They'll be adding all of the pre-ops um, next week. Uh, patient-facing healthcare workers and their symptomatic household members, symptomatic congregant living residents, dialysis and healthcare workers, those are being performed at the Minnesota Department of Health, first responders, and they will also be adding in next week symptomatic household members of first responders, as well as symptomatic child care workers and household members. Next slide, please. So what are some of the barriers that Rick is facing? He says, consistent availability of testing supplies. Many are related to government allocations. Cepheid and BioFire are good examples. My question to him was, I assume that these are national government allocations. He said, yes. I asked, does the state control where supplies go? He said, not really. And I said, also, I assume the intent for the allocations is to send more supplies to the hotspots. And he said, yes. So that's good news for the hotspots, but not good news for for other areas, um, even urban areas that are seeing a high number of uh, COVID-2 patients, but if you're not in a hot spot, um, you need to wait. So, um, Availability of collection supplies, he said, especially those swabs. Um, let's see, I'm not gonna read all of this. I said, in your opinion, is it warranted to sacrifice sensitivity for the ability to at least offer some type of testing? And he said, only as a last resort, bad specimen in, bad result out. And I said, perhaps you base this on the priority. And he said, that would be way too tough to manage that. 
Another barrier that Rick has had is, is that everybody wants us to include their group of patients for testing. And I said, I can't imagine how stressful that must be for you and your staff. And he said, it's really intense now because our normal business is down anywhere from 50 to 75% and we're gonna start to furlough employees, which is something that both Jim and Stephanie uh, talked about earlier. Um, the impact of testing patients and healthcare workers impacts the utilization of PPE. And my question was, are you able to recycle or reuse PPE through sterilization or other methods? And he said, we just work with 3M. 3M, of course, is a, a, a Minnesota-based company and have proved that we can re-sterilize our N95s and will lengthen the use by five times. And according to Rick, no other PPE can be sterilized or reused. And I asked him about 3D printing of NP swabs. Uh, he said, we were connected with a manufacturer of the swabs in Minnesota. He said, the problem is the flexibility of the shaft and also the brittleness of the swab tip compared to a flock swab. And I just said, ouch, that sounds really painful. I wouldn't want anyone using one of those on me. Okay, one more slide. I think this is the last one. And then in regards to um, best practices with serology IgG. So they are going to start to uh, test uh, patients to see if they have antibodies uh, to uh, SARS-CoV-2. And I said, I think this will be very important information to have, not only for helping to make decisions about healthcare workers with potential immunity, but also for studies on COVID-19 after this crisis has passed. I see that Mayo Clinic is using serology information to support their convalescent plasma program. And his response was, yes, we are in a study cohort with the American Red Cross and transfused our first patient today. We are being very careful, though, the IgG test would be to determine if someone has been exposed, not immunity at this point, because we just don't know for sure. So I think that is my last slide. Thank you for sticking with me through all that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Donna. That's fantastic information. And, you know, one thing that I just want to point out to all of our, you know, audience, both our clients as well as the listeners, you know, right now, the last number that I heard is we've only tested roughly 3 million people in the United States for COVID-19. And when you think about the sheer population of our country, we are still probably not quite yet to 1% of the population has actually been tested, whether that's for showing symptoms, asymptomatic, or et cetera. So we have a long way to go before we're actually sitting at a position from a public health perspective that we have tested enough of the population to understand the true spread of the disease. You know, right now, all the numbers that are being reported are only being reported on the tested population. Many of the rural communities or the smaller cities across the country, they're not even actually able to access testing at the rate that they need, which means that they're just providing protocols and treating patients based off of assumptions. You know, the assumption tends to be assume that the patient has COVID-19 and take steps like Jim mentioned on you know, cutting holes in the wall and putting the IV tube through the wall so that it's not actually coming into the room, keeping the cash crash carts outside the room so that you don't have to decontaminate them after you're using them. So right now it's a matter of treating everyone as if they have it, treat everyone as if they are already asymptomatic and taking as many protocols as you possibly can. And with that, I believe we have one or two questions coming in from our audience. So I'm gonna turn it over to our host momentarily to see if he's uh, taken any of those questions and then we'll flip back to our panelists for a minute or two. Yeah, we have a question from Corey Sylvester uh, for Jim. Jim, Corey's question is, how would a hospital optimize the 340B program to increase revenue given the future loss of insurance going to Medicaid? Yeah, it's a great, great question, great opportunity there, I think. And uh, it, one of the things, uh, oh, well, in fact, we, uh, we recently uh, had the opportunity to uh, support a uh, 340B program at a large academic medical center. And one of the things that we did was really go back and, and take a very careful look at uh, how their third party administrator was processing their claims to make sure that everything that was supposed to be in the 340B bucket was and that there was an excess use of the, the wholesale acquisition cost bucket. Um, and also to make sure that there was no backlog of pended claims where perhaps the third party administrator was missing uh, bits of information and so they were sitting on the claims, just cleaning that up was $9 million. So, I mean, that's probably an extreme case, but making sure that you really look with a fine tooth comb at everything that you are due um, 
and and then again doing that all in the in the context of full compliance as well. But yeah, you know, oftentimes there is some leakage there that you can pick up fairly quickly. All right, then I also believe Jim that you had a question or two from Marshall. If you want to go ahead and ask that. Yeah, Marshall, one of the things that we're seeing, I'd really be interested in what you're doing is, you know, how do you mitigate the potential of every organization wanting to stockpile meds and supplies and potentially contributing to artificial shortages? You know, that, that is a difficult one right now. Uh, our leaders are taking a look at that. Uh, we're at the mercy right now of the, the supply chain channel as well. So, you know, when we have, when we find that there are opportunities out there we're looking at you know what the historic volume of the organization that was purchasing as opposed to what they're ordering right now and are they in a hot spot area um, a couple other things that our, our internal teams look at and our contracting teams as well but we don't have a good handle on that right now and that's all that i have for submitted questions right now back to you steph yeah, Stephanie, maybe one comment too on on testing. There was a really interesting article or uh, uh, article that came out in the New England Journal yesterday uh, from New York, where they were routinely testing all of the obstetrics patients coming into the hospital to deliver. And what they found were one in eight were positive. Many of them had symptoms, but they found 29 patients who were positive and completely asymptomatic. So again, highlighting the need for for expanded testing. Yeah, I've I've seen some articles that have shared similar information like that, Jim, and they've ranged anywhere from the thought that one in eight might be asymptomatic, or you know, even we've gotten some results that are one in fifteen. And if you think about again the sheer population of the United States, the only way we're ever going to truly get to the other side of the pandemic is to get to the point of actually having a lot more tests available so that we can test a larger portion of the population. And that truly is going to ultimately end up being you know, one of the areas where we end up making a significant difference as we move through this public health crisis. So you know, for all of our participants, you know, we've touched upon a lot of information today on both laboratory and pharmacy. If you have any follow-up information for our panelists, so please make sure that you're subscribing to Altius Answers. Uh, we just released a great episode of Altius Answers this week from Dr. Jerry Paleo. Dr. Paleo focuses on burnout and resiliency, and her podcast really talked about the situation that's occurring right now on the front lines. You know, we have a lot of our frontline workers that have been dealing with shifts where they might actually be at the hospital for 12-hour shifts, 24-hour shifts, et cetera. And whether it's they're in a hot spot or they're in a rural area that just right now is just having difficulty with staffing issues, um, whether they've had to furlough workers or other situations, we're finding right now that that's a big problem that's occurring. So one of the things that I'd really encourage everyone to do is you know, really review that in, that podcast, watch burnout. You know, as your staff members are going through things, Dr. Playo talks about some things that you can identify within your work staff that really exhibit steps to burnout. And the other thing she, she touches upon is that first line responders that are actually in the hotspots right now may in the future start to really see situations that mimic post-traumatic stress syndrome. So as we're you know, evaluating, you heard Jim say that there was a hospital that was dealing with multiple codes all at one time and not having enough staff at that hospital to actually respond to the codes. Well, if you're a nurse, you're a tech, you're a patient, wherever you are in the actual hospital unit, you're hearing all that coding, you're dealing with all that, you're going to have some post-traumatic stress syndromes that come as a result of that. So the Dr. Paleo Altius Answers episode is extremely valuable information. I highly recommend that everyone looks for that and subscribes to that and watches it because she has some great burnout during organizational change information and ways that you can deal with that and, and foster resiliency at your own facilities. So with that, thank you to all the panelists, Marshall, Donna, Jim, thank you for joining us today. I think all of our listeners have found this information extremely useful and very valuable to everyone. So thank you all for your participation. Thank you. Thanks, Stephanie. Welcome. All right, thank you for joining. And for everyone else, make sure you're subscribing to the Altius Virtual Roundtables. I look for it within your Catalyst client portal as well as on YouTube. We're also out there on the Altius Answers podcast. You can find us on Spotify and Apple. 
thank you very much. And if you have additional questions, either for the session today, reach out to us. And if you have topics you'd like us to cover next week and in future weeks, please let us know. Thank you very much. Thank you.